Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and uh, we are joined by Dr. Tim Ball. Uh, Dr. Tim, you have some very remarkable things to uh, to tell us today about the uh, Green Agenda. We have a graph, actually, I'm going to post up today. It'll be on today's show. People will be able to see it over on uh, clayandiron.com and uh, on in the body of the, of the article today. Uh, the Green Agenda really is moving forward at the speed of light now that Obama thinks he has a mandate, which, is, of course, a great deal of it was, for, I call, voter fraud, uh, manipulation of the public, and, of course, the, the gifting of many things to the sort of entitlement crowd. Um, this, this Green Agenda actually is very toxic not only to the environment, the real environment, and real environmentalism, but it also is very bad for the economy. It's very bad for populations on Earth. And literally, the Green Agenda will starve billions. So uh, this is not a good way of doing it. It also doesn't protect the environment from toxic pollution. It doesn't set up industrial policy or public health or uh, workers' compensation policy for safety at work. It really doesn't address any of these issues, does it? No, and and, uh, one of the things that we've got to keep reminding ourselves is that for the green agenda, which as you and I have discussed, comes out of the Malthus and out of the Club of Rome, um, underlying that is constantly overpopulation. And, um, you know, I used to tease some of the environmentalists about, say, well, why, why are you fighting to stop AIDS in Africa? Isn't that a population control? Isn't that one of the things Malthus uh, listed as a natural form of controlling population? But, of course, in their philosophical contradictions, they don't want to think about things like that. And, um, and so, uh, what, what you're seeing is with, with all of these things that, um, the people that they profess to care about and and, and uh, worry about, uh, in fact, are the ones that suffer. And you see that with, for example, with the CO2, oh, we've got to have alternate energy. So massive tax uh, benefits going into biofuels and the cost of corn uh, uh, just going through the roof and the number of people starving to death because of food prices going up. Um, it, it's just a, a, a classic example of, of uh, literally killing people with kindness and ignorance. And um, so that's what's happening. <clears throat> Now, the um, the other thing, Dr. Bill, is that um, the Kyoto Protocol, of course, um, was basically, um, well, there are two things about it. One, one was, of course, it was a, a redistribution of wealth, that they decided that um, overpopulation and the pressure it put on resources had become a problem because of industry and industrialized nations. Therefore, those, those nations that were then defined as developed nations, and they actually listed them in the Kyoto Protocol, 13 of them, developed nations, they were going to have to pay for their sins. It was another of the sin taxes. You know, you're going to smoke, you're going to drink, you're going to enjoy yourself, you're going to pay for it. And uh, so, uh, and I don't mean just pay health-wise, but also financially. And so uh, the carbon tax was, of course, this way that you paid for your sins, and that money was then going to go to the developing nations. Um, The stupid thing about it is, of course, that in the interim, um, the economies have changed around so much, um, and, and uh, as you know, Dr. Bill, from your experience, prediction and uh, making forecasts, um, especially in the whole social sciences area, are, are, are virtually impossible. Um, but the, the, uh, uh, the developing nations like India and China uh, which were not required to reduce CO2 levels, are now producing CO2 at much, much greater rates than the U.S. In fact, the U.S. has declined in its production since 2004. And it did that, by the way, without signing Kyoto, but um, simply voluntarily. It was one, one of the things that George Bush was pushing was a, a voluntary reduction program. Now, of course, it's been exacerbated by the declining economy, and uh, the effect that, that the negative effects that's going to have on poor people and health and so on, and and so um, what what we're seeing is 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 a complete collapse of 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 the original ideas because the original ideas and assumptions were absolutely wrong, right. and, and of course that 
that, as you know, um, and, and I think we have talked about that before, but we need to talk about it again, and that is that in, in the scientific method, um, scientists create hypotheses. Um, these are speculations, is a uh, scientific word for speculation, and the speculation says, well, if, 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 and the if, ifs are the assumptions. So you're saying, well, if this is true, and if this is true, and if this is true, then this could happen. And, of course, what happens in proper scientific method is other scientists who then perform as skeptics, as they properly should be, um, and the use of that term to deride uh, skeptics it shows how uh, political this is. The skeptics uh, then challenge it, and, and they don't challenge the hypothesis. They challenge the assumptions. And, of course, um, it's, it's like with Einstein's theory. One of the assumptions is nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Well, if you can, if you can challenge that and show that that assumption is incorrect, then the formula E equals MC squared, um, as logically derived as it is, simply uh, goes out the window. And what exactly. happened with yeah, what happened with the um, uh, CO2 uh, hypothesis that the uh, Club of Rome and then the IPCC developed? They made the basic assumption that if CO2 increases, temperature will go up. Well, there's no record where that happens. And yet they built that into their computer models, and then uh, the computer models said, oh, temperature's going to go up uh, because CO2 is increasing. But what's happening right now, and has happened since, uh, well, almost 2000, CO2's continue to increase and the temperature's going down. And, yeah, and yet, uh, yeah, and yet they continue with all of these false policies of reduction of CO2, of, of alternate energies that don't work, of wasting billions of dollars when, when other far more important issues, as you discussed so eloquently on your program, need to get addressed. They're not getting the funding, not getting the attention, and not getting the concern that they should get. Well, we talked about the scientific method. There's three processes that have to occur. The first is data gathering, and what they've done yeah. at the IPCC, you mentioned in previous programs, they dismissed yeah. northern uh, data, so they made the data shift towards southern data, which means it's going to be yeah. warmer. The second thing, assumption they've made, is they've actually made predictive models based on something that's faulty. Just like the chlorofluorocarbon model of years ago, a, you can't float a brick in a, in a, in a tub. Uh, yeah. CO2 is not the primary cause of global warming. It's solar activity. Uh, and the, the third thing is when they make these predictive models, they make a series of, of uh, nonlinear equations and they eliminate data that they don't understand. And when they do that, they create a predictive model that creates in cyberspace a world where it's warming, but in actual fact, when you may take the actual measurements, it's cooling. And then they also deal with what I call pseudo-environmentalism, where you don't have real concern over heavy metals being released by smokestacks in China and Asia and toxic chemicals and heavy metals that will rain down on us and uh, toxically affect our population. And, of course, these toxins also affect the benthic layer of the oceans that make 80% of the oxygen. The real issue is what's called peak oxygen, that we can't still keep on chopping down the rainforest and killing the benthic layer of the oceans because the carbon-oxygen cycle has a lot of stretch. If you put more CO2 out, like in a greenhouse, you're going to get a lot more oxygen generated. Uh, there is a limit, and that limit is quite a ways up because there are times in the ancient past where the oxygen concentration was much higher as well as the CO2, and it's not toxic, as they tried to say. So yeah, well, yeah. <clears throat> all of these assumptions tell us that they've literally hijacked uh, science and environmentalism for geopolitical uh, purposes. Yeah. And the latest, of course, is Igor, I call him, Al Gore, and his foolish yeah. attempt to say that he can't, doesn't have the money now to continue to fight the big fight. Yep. And, and by the way, with the rainforest, uh, we can talk about that because it was a World Bank policy that led to uh, a dramatic increase in the amount of rainforest being cleared. Exactly. The World Bank, because it's just like the dialectic of what's going on in Gaza, which I'm writing an article on for uh, GCN and for our website. Back in a moment with Dr. Tim Ball. Welcome back, and uh, out of this uh, very bizarre theory about uh, global warming and CO2, I read an article uh, yesterday 
that suggested that the spruce budworm that's killing the forest is actually contributing to global warming indirectly by causing these trees to die. <clears throat> the, the fact is that we're not dealing with space weather in our so-called models. We're not dealing with increased, uh, at least two bands of ultraviolet light that are putting in danger crops and trees. Uh, we're not dealing with the fact that, uh, you know, that some of the toxins we're releasing from industry can be toxic to the phytoplankton in the upper 30 feet of water, the benthic layer of the oceans. Or the fact that our banking policies, like the World Bank, is actually pushing policies to cut down the rainforest in the Amazon uh, in Brazil, etc., or the fast, one of the fastest growing countries of the BRIC nations. As a result, <clears throat> we're, we're not the cause of the problem, but we're certainly making the world more toxic, and we're also killing the layers of the ocean to allow the carbon oxygen cycle to work. We don't have any shortage of oil. That's another lie, the, you know, that's like peak oil. Uh, we do have a problem with what I call peak oxygen. At some point, if we continue killing the oceans and cutting down the uh, forests, the Earth's capacity, its lungs, to recycle carbon dioxide into oxygen will be limited. And uh, none of these things are being addressed directly. <clears throat> they want to put carbon taxes and sequestration of carbon in the midst of this disaster of killing the oceans with toxic pollution will crash the oxygen concentration in the 21st century and force human beings to start building domed cities. And uh, people don't see this. They don't see this future is very possible that we could have the center of our city so hypoxic that frontal lobe activity of people literally makes us enter the zombie apocalypse. People think, oh, that's just uh, foolishness. It's a, it's a theme for a late night TV show or a big blockbuster movie that scares uh, the hell out of people. But the fact is, these things are very real, <clears throat> and our policies, instead of saving the environment, are going to actually kill it. Yeah, well, Dr. Bell, I mentioned just before the break about the World Bank and the rainforests. Uh, what happened was the World Bank decided that um, in order to have a viable economy in the modern world, you needed an agricultural base. And uh, I know, for example, within Canada, the northern boundaries of the prairie or the provinces in western Canada were set at 60 degrees. And there were no provinces north of that because they said you, you, you couldn't have an agricultural base to your economy. That idea, of course, is... is uh, fading away a little bit, but the World Bank took it into Brazil and said, look, if you're going to have a good economy, you've got an agricultural base, and we'll provide you with money, provided you set up a tax that's uh, a benefit for people that clear the forest and start agriculture. And of course, that's what triggered it. And um, when, once uh, once they realized what was going on, of course, they, they, they cut back on it, but it, it was all done because of complete lack of understanding of nature, the environment, environment, the soils. They never thought to look at the fact that the rainforest, which is enormously wealthy in terms of plant and, and uh, animal life, but is actually incredibly fragile. You take that, you cut the forest down, and you expose those bright red soils that are 90% oh, iron ore, um, and they bake rock hard, and they, they don't grow anything. Now, that's, that's well known in the literature. For example, um, during the Second World War, Henry Ford built a place called Fordlandia in the Amazon rainforest and tried to grow rubber trees there because they couldn't get the rubber from Malaysia anymore, and, and it failed completely. The Brits, after the Second World War, uh, tried groundnuts or peanuts, as the Americans call them, uh, in order to get a vegetable oil in Africa. It failed as a disaster. And the most recent one back in the 70s, um, a, a Philadelphia uh, billionaire uh, tried to get uh, grow eucalyptus trees in the Amazon rainforest uh, with uh, the name of Ludwig, and it was equally disastrous. And so they keep doing these things without looking at the true uh, nature of nature and understanding the mechanics of it and, and uh, doing uh, things that end up causing greater problems. And, of course, that, uh, that applies to the, the CO2 issue. I mean, Gore's running around saying that CO2 levels are at the highest ever. In fact, they're not. They're the lowest in 300 million years. Um, and uh, the the plants are malnourished at 390 parts per million is what, what they're claiming right now. Uh, all the research and, and the records show for the last 300 million years, the average level of CO2 in the atmosphere is 1,200 parts per million. Yeah, in fact, and that's plants, when these plants, the, the plants uh, developed. 
so yeah. that they are optimally healthy. And it's almost like the option, optimal concentration for humans is yeah. between 21 and 30 percent, not 10, 11 percent like the center of cities like Sao Paulo, Brazil, where people exactly. basically start acting crazy because their frontal lobes are highly metabolic. You get decreased yeah. metabolic activity of the executive areas of their brain, and they start acting bizarre. Yeah, in, in fact, greenhouse operators have um, increased the yield of their plants in the greenhouse by a factor of four uh, by pumping in up to 1,200 parts per million of CO2. And some of them have been doing that for decades. Yeah, and exactly. So the, the, the science of it is well known, but, but what happens is when you hijack science for political or geopolitical gain, uh, this you, you end up creating disastrous problems, as you discuss uh, so eloquently, yeah. as I said, every day on your program. Yeah, and, we talk about and, this uh, with, uh, every Wednesday with, uh, we talk about this every Wednesday with uh, Professor McCanny. Uh, yeah. And what happens is that uh, what he said basically is tier one science is basically classified science. It's some of its yeah. ancient uh, science that has been passed on by secret orders uh, and secret societies. Uh, it's now ensconced into the, uh, if you want to call it classified areas of government and the military industrial intelligence complex. Then we get what we call pseudoscience, which is a form of bizarre cultic. Uh, tier two science it's neither adheres to hypotheses or theoretical science precepts and corollaries, and as a result, they they, they bring out dogma and try to parade it as if it's science. It's not science at all. It's dogma, and it looks like yeah. science, but it isn't. One of the ways that they do this, Doctor Bill, is that we I already talked about the hypothesis and the assumption. <laughs> But they also do it in definition of terms. Now, everybody's familiar with when you were teenagers, you'd get into arguments, and then somebody say, well, you know, how are you defining that term? And then you find out that, that uh, you're talking about the same thing, you just don't realize it. And um, I, I learned this a long time ago uh, when I was appointed to uh, be on a commission of inquiry. Uh, you know, there'd be conflict over an issue and, and uh, all sorts of data and arguments flying around. And finally, the government would step in and say, well, we'll have a commission of inquiry. And I used to think, wow, great, wonderful, finally get to the truth. The first commission I was on made me realize that it was the, it was the, the uh, first stage of complete cover-up. Uh, because the government not only chose who was on the commission, but they defined the terms for the commission and the definition of the terms for the commission. Right. And I re and, and by the way, and that's where so many of the conspiracy theories that are just abounding on the net, as you know, that's where a lot of them start because people realize that there's something being hidden here. And they get into cons the conspiracy theories. Well, the, the truth is a lot of them are, are not conspiracies. They're real, really going on. And uh, the classic one I mentioned is, is um, uh, the uh, Warren Commission and the shooting of, of John Kennedy. And uh, it, where uh, just, Justice Warren, in an interview, um, was, was asked about it. And we can talk about that after the break. And I'll, I'll explain what the problem is. A absolutely. Back in a moment with Dr. Tim Ball. DrTimBall.com is the website. DrTimBall.com. Welcome back, and Dr. Tim Ball, your website is drtimball. What's the latest article you've written, and where is it posted? Well, I, I did one on, on what's up with that with regard to uh, uh, Al Gore and, and uh, what, what he's been doing. Um, and then um, I've, I've got um, a couple of other articles about, the, about what's wrong with the IPCC science um, on the website. But uh, we were talking about that, the Warren Commission, uh, just before the break there. And I watched an interview with uh, Chief Justice Warren uh, before he passed away. Uh, and he was asked in the interview, uh, why didn't you look at the mafia connection in Dallas? And he made a comment that most of the public would have not have understood the significance of it because he said, well, it wasn't in my terms of reference. Well, I knew from my experience that those terms of reference are how politicians and bureaucrats control what these commissions of inquiry uh, look at. 
And one yeah, it's the like the administrative law judges do when they have a commission over smart meters. They set up the term yeah. of reference. So if you as a doctor walk in and say, I want to raise questions in my community about uh, smart meters, they say, yeah. well, it's not in our terms of reference. In other words, they try to circumscribe what you can even raise issues about. Exactly. They, they control what's discussed. And, and, and of course, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, or, or too, with the Warren Commission, I mean, what, what is most of the um, uh, discussion been about with conspiracy theories with the Kennedy assassination is because they fail to deal with these issues. And, well, uh, the, there's, people there's, keep... there's, there's a slow moving. Yeah. Uh, I want to make a connection of a couple of things and see your opinion yeah. on it. The, the the most serious move to, today, and people don't see the connection, for example, with the rocket attacks in Gaza or QE3 from the globalist environmental agenda, but they're all linked. Just like the the uh, lack of movement by Obama, even though he lied through the election, saying that he was approving oil exploration and the, and the XL pipeline up to Canada uh, and the new refineries and so on in America. There hasn't been a new refinery license in, in, since 1975 in America especially uh, to, to refine the kind of oil that will come out of the American gas and oil fields. So what we have is a bunch of liars, especially Obama. He is what we call the liar-in-chief. That's why they had, well, before the election, they had a number of comedic uh, pictures of what I'm calling the lying king. He's sort of the lion king. Uh, what would happen is QE3 basically is going to flood the earth with tons more money, which means instead of 87% of the physically produce dollars and electronic dollars, it'll be over 90% soon. With America and the Fed Reserve, which is a foreign company, uh, supporting the production of, of the of the servicing the debt in Europe and America, and of course they don't really want to fix this fiscal cliff. They'll do a stopgap to make it look like it's been fixed, but it's not going to be fixed at all. Because the real issue is, just like the Gazans, if they want to stop that issue in Gaza, and I'm writing this article, they could simply uh, go, uh, you know, because they gave the Sinai Peninsula back to Egypt and uh, then cordoned off uh, Gaza and knew there were tunnels there. They knew where they were bringing in rocket parts to, to rocket Israel. And instead, what they decided is to invest in Iron Dome when they knew it was going to be leaky and kill Israeli citizens and put the whole nation in danger because they want the dialectic, just like they want the environmental issues. They don't want to solve it. I mean, America could literally simply have a, a bilateral agreement with China to say we're not going to allow your goods into the country unless you put smokestack scrubbers so you can stop uh, putting out heavy metals. We don't care how much CO2 you put out. It's good for the planet. But heavy metals, mercury, et cetera, from uh, poor quality coal without scrubbers, but none of these issues are going to be dealt with because it serves the globalists to have the dialectic of chaos. So they're not going to fix Gaza. They're, they're, they want disruption in the Middle East, which keeps the price of oil up. They, they want eventually to bring in the Prudhoe Bay Liberty ring, rig and the other issues, but they want to do it after their period of time where they run the social dialectic of communist and Marxist corporate fascism under Obama so that they can uh, further align America with the New World Order and a globalist agenda. They've got to crush our economy, crush our middle class, Forced down our throats, things that are really not, don't make any sense, like, you know, we have forced vaccinations, mandatory. I just read an article today, a mandatory, uh, you want to call RFID tags, so the kids in school in Texas, in this one school, are being expelled because they refuse to take the tag. I mean, this is all tied in with a green agenda. People don't see it. They don't see that the Agenda 21 is to force the populations into super compact uh, zones of population with rewilding of America and the world. All the underground resources, including this law of the seas treaty, is to pass all the resources to the United Nations. That means all the methane hydrate balls at the bottom of the ocean, which are estimated to be 300 times more energy than all proven oil resources reserves and coal on Earth, are now under the control of the U.N., I mean, it doesn't stop. And the UN, of course, no. is just another proxy for the British and the British banks and the globalists that basically want to own everything. Yeah, but of course, one of the things, Dr. Bill, as you know, is, is that um, as you start digging into anything, you, you just uh, unearth, even though you're just scratching the surface and you, you become very aware of how you're scratching the surface, of, of the amount of data that is simply not understood, not known, not available uh, for people to make decisions. I mean, just, just as an example, and, and by the way, what's interesting... You're talking about the IPCC that, and these decisions well, by the United Nations... 
Yeah, but they, they, they'll, they'll get angry at you. They actually start to get what I call go into a rage attack. Like, how dare you, you know, blaspheme yeah. the, the the climate scientists yeah. and, and say after all this time that there isn't global warming, and you're looking and you're saying, my gosh, you're shivering. You're saying, we're soon going to shiver in the dark because they're not hardening the grid against CMEs. We're heading, yeah. as Dr. Easterbrook and Dr. Habibil Adamazatov and many others have proven two years ago at their conference in Chicago, June, that uh, we're heading into an ice age. By 2014, it'll be evident we have at least a monitor type mini ice age. The nearest will yep. cool to about the 2065 to 2070. This is not a joke. People no, don't realize no. when those cold zones happen, you don't have the breadbasket of Canada and the United States. You're going to have mass starvations of billions of people. And then they don't deal with the ozone layer or the magnetic shift because that magnetic shift happens with the magnetic field, flux field drops. The Earth is going to be based by solar cosmic radiation and ultraviolet light, and much of the crops are going to die. And they literally, the crops yeah. will turn white, just like it says in the Bible. But, uh, Dr. Bill, you know, you, you, you mentioned uh, about the... Um, uh, the changes that are going on with the monitor minimum and the cooling the, right. that's be, the the when we talked about uh, definition of terms and assumptions the intergovernmental panel on climate change their definition of climate change is that they are only looking at those changes caused by humans they don't look look at natural changes at all yeah, and, they don't look and, at methane and, hydrate released from the no, from permafrost they don't really no. talk about the under oceanic volcanism they don't talk no. about the gacko range why the uh, ice shelf is 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 melting but even more and, fundamental and, and, than that you yeah. see what the one when you look at what they did look at they they the the one natural forcing that they looked at when I, when and when they say forcing something that causes change um they did look at the sun but they only looked at electromagnetic radiation from the sun that is heat and light and what they determined was no matter how they fiddled their models it explained over 50 percent of temperature variation up until 1950 well they couldn't have that so what they've now said is well since 1950 co2 from humans explains over 90 percent of the temperature increase and yes, I mean, it's suddenly, different. magically in 1950 this incredible change occurred but what they ignore is they ignore the uh, Sun-Earth relationship changes called Milankovitch effect. They ignore the fact that as the Sun's magnetic field changes, the amount of low cloud in our uh, on the Earth changes, just like a, a, a screen in a greenhouse, and that correlates with temperature, of course. None of that is included in their models. And as I mentioned earlier, they start with the assumption that if CO2 increases, temperature increases, but there's no record to shows that. Every single record shows exactly the opposite. So you see the problem. But um, back to my point about data um, and, and uh, of course, what, what they've been doing with all of the temperature data records around the world, and it's all put together in what's called the Global Historical Climate Network, GHCN, they have adjusted uh, every single one of the records there, and they've adjusted them all in one direction. What they've done is is they've lowered the temperatures from decades ago, which then makes the slope of the increase of temperature look greater than it actually was. Exactly. It's a total deception. Yeah. It is a science fraud. And we're back with Dr. Tim Ball. Um, Dr. Tim, periodically when we have you on, this next four years is going to be a year, as in, in the Latin is an ennis horribus, a horrible year because yeah. not because of the approaching comments we've talked about with uh, Professor McCanny, who's on every Wednesday in the third hour, but because of the dangers of what I call stupid policy. For example, here's the policies that should be done by America and Canada and the West dealing with the pollution from Asia and India and these other countries. It's not CO2. We're not going to buy your goods unless you have smokestack scrubbers. We're going to have countervailing tariffs against your goods when you, you don't have environmental standards in your factories so that you have a decent wage for your people and living conditions and workers' compensation. We want freedom in the West, which means we don't want government policy invading our bedrooms and everywhere else. We want our policies so that the government just simply defends the borders and provides national infrastructure. But beyond that, 
uh, the government is becoming overburdening. And, of course, the micromanagers, like Obama, believe the communist ideal, which is that the central government and the central planners always know better than the people in the individual areas in their counties and their cities and states or in Canada and provinces, and that local government is the only kind of government that ever works. National and international global governments never work. The no. problem is that policies, when it's environmental, are going to destroy the environment, destroy populations, degrade the production of energy, which is literally the real currency of the world is energy. It's not dollars. Uh, yeah. They've tried to make it dollars, but it really isn't. It's energy. And we're on the verge of limitless energy with not only the abiotic oil discovery, which there's tons of oil everywhere and gas, but uh, the idea that we have tokamak fusion reactors, advanced technology, we don't need to be destroying the environment in order to have energy production. But it, it, it behooves the globalists to push bankers to actually cut down the rainforests, to create want, and to create uh, you know these wild swings in prices and commodities so they can starve out much of the population because they really people don't want to get this. But the real agenda is not just the green agenda to shove down. Uh, carbon taxes is to get rid of much of the population of the planet. They don't want 90% of us alive. Yep, that's right. And and uh, and of course, then then you you uh, look at it in terms of of pushing the idea of democracy. And um, yeah, it's a very good idea, but yeah, it's, ta- ta- got, it's got to. To mention that term, that quote from that quote from that uh, academic yeah, over 100 Macaulay. years ago. Yes, yeah, Lord Macaulay, yeah, this, he, he wrote this in a letter to an American friend in 1857. He said, a democracy cannot survive as a permanent form of government. It can last only until its citizens discover that they can vote themselves largesse from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority who vote will vote for the candidates promising the greatest benefits from the public purse with the result that a democracy will always collapse from loose fiscal policies, always followed with a dictatorship. And that's 1857. So, uh, you know, you can see the pattern uh, that's going on. And, of course, uh, George Bernard Shaw, the great cynic, uh, said it more succinctly when he said, if you rob Peter to pay Paul, you're guaranteed of Paul's vote. But there's another issue, uh, Dr. Bill. And and a corollary to that is that eventually your economy will peter out. Hey, there you go. <laughs> right. You like that? Eh? Right. Right. That's very good. And, yeah, and, and, and there's no revelation on the road to Damascus. But anyway, yeah, exactly. um, yeah no, I, I was. A, there was a very interesting story the other day that sort of just flies by people. But everybody thinks, oh well, we know what's going on in the world. It's the global village. We got all this data, and and of course you can get on the internet and find this, that, and the other. But the reality is, we know virtually nothing. Uh, you know, Dr. Bill, from uh, your research that uh, uh, it's estimated that we've only found and identified about 35% of all the plants and animals in the world. But yeah. here's an even more bizarre, bizarre one. Um, in Canada, you know, governments print money, and there's money floating out there. And I have always asked the question, because I remember when, when Trudeau was in power and his finance minister said, well, you know, here's the deficit. But he said, of course, I don't know within $5 billion how accurate that is. And I thought, What's, what is he saying? Well, here's one example of it. It turns out that Canada was producing $1,000 bills. They stopped producing them 10 years ago. Uh, but they're still legal tender. And there's almost a million of them still in circulation, but they don't know where they are. So there's a billion dollars worth of Canadian banknotes out there floating around, and the government have no idea where they are. So how can you possibly know that you know what's going on with the economy and what the debt is and what this is and what that is? I mean, just with that one small example. Now, of course, in wartime, which is where a lot of the problems that we currently have with the control of government began, in wartime, you change the rules. And what happens in wartime, and some might remember there was an episode of of MASH that was done on this, was called Script Day, where you just, in order to offset counterfeiting, and by the way, nobody was a bigger counterfeiter in history than than Adolf Hitler, um, in order to offset counterfeiting, you just simply pick a day and secretly bring out a whole new currency, which then means all of the existing currency that out there is, is is no good. 
And so, and, and by the way, what's interesting in that story with the Canadian thousand dollar bills, they estimate that 90% of them are in the hands of criminals. And um, so th that illustrates the point. But what happened with the Second World War in particular was that we surrendered, uh, and we say we, most people in the West, uh, and uh, uh, fighting the war, uh, surrendered our individual rights to the government in order to carry out the collective effort of winning the war. The problem was, after the war, and this happened particularly in England, uh, the governments uh, were very loath to give back uh, a lot of the rights that they had assumed. And as you and I have discussed, you know, income tax was brought in as a temporary measure to pay for a war. Uh, and yet here it is uh, now almost completely controlling our lives. And so that, that's where, where the rot began. And, and of course, uh, people, we now, to basing on, on Lord Macaulay's comment, we're now 70 years after the war. We've got many, many generations that, ha that have no concept of, of less government. They can't imagine a world without uh, any government or, or even a reduced government. Well, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. The nanny state has fangs claws and is giving off toxic industrial gas yeah <laughs> yeah but the, the other thing dr bill is that um if you if you were to sit down and write a check and whether you're american or canadian or british you know not, not, not so much british they've got a different structure of government but if you were to write a check for for the uh, federal provincial and municipal levels of government um you write about 34 percent federal 18 percent provincial and nine percent municipal but who provides for you most on a daily basis who provides uh, all of the your things that you need for your daily life like education and roads and so on and and what we need to do is turn that pyramid over it should be only nine percent going to the federal government and 34 percent to the municipal government where the people then have more control of what's going on but of course we've turned it upside down because of the war and because of, the, of those governments bringing in more and more oh just temporary taxing measures and 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 voting themselves more and more power and that's what we're seeing every day and and nobody's doing it more more swiftly and more with with greater draconian impact than than uh, Obama. Yeah, and he's setting a he's outdoing Pierre Elliott Trudeau that turned uh, Canada into a socialist uh, pseudo communist state. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it's, and, it's, and he's proceeding at the speed of light. In fact, I got an article here. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, heard about this in the past, but Russian news outlet Pravda. Previously, uh, the official press of the U.S. Are labels Obama a communist and scathing op-ed. This is Pravda. Uh, yeah. I had a uh, nuclear physicist on about four years ago in the program who was there in 1992 after Glasnost and Perestroika and met two senior physicists that are members of the GRU and KGB. And they said, uh, oh, yeah, we, you're going to have a future president. His name is Barack Obama. And I said, who's he? Well, don't worry. He's only a social organizer, but he will be your president. This is 1992. This is before he became a state senator, uh, and then became a, 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 a junior senator in the U.S. Senate before he was ever considered a candidate. So, in other words, the yeah. globalists have got a plan, and yeah. their plan is to set up these dialectics, and that's why even yeah. during the Second World War and after, we shipped nuclear materials to Russia to make sure they could build a bomb. Yeah, but people should read Vaclav Klaus, uh, who, when he spoke at the first uh, Skeptics Climate Conference in New York, his opening remark was, we've gone through 70 years of communism, why the hell would you want to go back to that? And exactly. Klaus is the only world leader that's spoken out about what's going on, and he wrote a wonderful little book called Blue Planet in Green Shackles. And what is endangered, climate or freedom, is the subtitle. And exactly. I'll tell you, it... It's a real eye opener to what you're talking about, Dr. Bill. Yeah. So, so, social progressive yep. totalitarianism, otherwise known as communism, is the only yep. vehicle that can enforce the green agenda on the planet. Yep. It's yep, ridiculous. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tim Ball. Again, the website, drtimball.com. We'll have you back on soon. Hour two coming up, and hour three. Back in a moment.